Isn't the Bible sexist? Um, I think the first question I'd want to ask is to say, why shouldn't people be sexist? If we have a worldview that tells us the strong eliminate the weak, and if you can dominate people, why not do it? It's actually in the Bible that we see a vision for equality between men and women, both male and female, bearing together the image of God. And um, the story of the Bible really um, plays that out in, in amazing ways. So even in the Old Testament, you see a woman like Miriam leading a whole nation in worship. You see a woman like Deborah leading a nation politically and making judgments, making decisions, and even leading her country to war. You see that women didn't require men to be a kind of mediator between them and God. They could pray directly to God. They didn't need a husband or a father to have a relationship with God. Now, sometimes people say, yeah, but come on, in Genesis, all right, um, women and men both bear the image of God, but doesn't the Bible call women sort of helpers? Isn't that word in there, the word helper? I don't know what your visual image is when you think of that. When I think of that, I imagine a woman in an apron, hands in the kitchen sink, lots of bubbles, definitely up to the elbows, you know, maybe with a bit of a chain on, stuck in there doing all the housework. Well, actually, the Hebrew word that is translated there, helper, is the word Eza. And it's not a a, a term of domination or or subjugation because God uses that name, Isa, to describe himself in his relationship to us as human beings. God is our Isa. He is our helper. It's a powerful, strong, amazing, not sexist image. And then when we come to the New Testament, we see that Jesus directly resists the sexism that he sees and observes around him. There's a story in John's Gospel in chapter 4 where um, a woman is talking to Jesus and the male disciples come and they see this. They see Jesus one-on-one with a woman and it says they're amazed, they're horrified, they're staggered. What? to see him just talking one-on-one to a woman. Jesus considered women to be worthy of theological instruction. It was a woman called Martha who was the recipient of one of the most amazing doctrinal statements of the New Testament. I am the resurrection and the life. Anyone who believes in me will live and they will never die. There weren't men around to hear that. Jesus just spoke that to Martha. And then you see this sort of amazing pattern emerge as you read the New Testament where women have this sort of front row seat and extraordinary role of witnessing the core elements of the faith. So it's Mary who's the primary witness to the incarnation, the virgin birth. It's the women at the cross who are the primary witnesses to the crucifixion, to the atonement, to the cross of Jesus. The men have all disappeared apart from John. It's only women who are there witnessing the cross. And then, of course, it is women who are first at um, the resurrection. And then when you read the New Testament, you see in the early church that women like Phoebe led the church in Rome. Women like Junia were considered to be outstanding by Paul among the apostles. So amidst all of that testimony within the Bible, that the Bible isn't sexist, there are three verses which some people have used to say, actually, women should be subjugated. There's a verse in 1 Corinthians that talks about women being silent in church. Now, how do we understand that? Well, I think if you read the whole letter of Corinthians, you see that in the same letter, the same author tells women how to prophesy when they prophesy in church, which meant speak publicly. And it says, you know, have your hair covered. That meant just modesty in those days. Don't, don't kind of be, you know, showing off your body or your hair while you prophesy. So clearly it didn't mean women should never speak and be silent. It's speaking to a, a specific group of women who were disrupting the services. Another verse talks about men being the head of women. The Greek word is kephali. And sometimes that's been taken to mean kind of dominance or subjugation. But if you read the verse in context, you see that God is the head of Christ. 
So if it means hierarchy, that doesn't make sense of, of the Trinity. So whatever that kefali word means in terms of a relationship between a man and a woman in a marriage, it doesn't mean domination. In fact, as we read anything about leadership in God's kingdom, we see it's primarily about service, about love, about laying our lives down for one another. And then there's another verse in 1 Timothy chapter 2 that talks about women not teaching not being permitted to teach or, or have authority. Now remember, we've already been taught by women like Martha, by women like Mary. We've already seen that women like Priscilla taught. We know that Phoebe taught. She was in authority over the Roman church. So what does that mean? Well, Paul was writing that letter of, of, Timothy to, uh, of um, 1 Timothy to the leader of the Ephesian church, Timothy. And the context there was the worship of the goddess Artemis, where women dominated and subjugated men in, the, in that culture. And it seems like that, as those women got converted, had crept into the Ephesian church. So Paul is helping Timothy to correct that specific pastoral situation. And most likely, those women were saying, well, Paul says that everyone has sinned in Adam, that we all sinned in Adam. They weren't Jewish. They didn't even know about Eve. They just heard about this guy, Adam, who caused the world to sin. And then the second Adam, Jesus. And Paul is saying, Timothy, no, you need to explain to them that Eve was involved. She actually sinned first. I want to um, just finish this answer quickly by giving you a quote from one of my favorite apologists, a woman called Dorothy L. Sayers, and she writes this about Jesus. Perhaps it is no wonder that the women were the first at the cradle and the last at the cross. They had never known a man like this man. There never had been such another, a prophet and teacher who never nagged at them, never flattered or coaxed or patronized, who never made arch jokes about them and never treated as the, them as the women, God help us, or the ladies, God bless them, who rebuked without querulousness and praised without condescension, who took their questions and arguments seriously, who never mapped out their sphere for them never urged them to be feminine or jeered at them for being female, who had no axe to grind and no uneasy male dignity to defend, who took them as he found them and was completely unselfconscious. There is no act, no sermon, no parable in the whole gospel that borrows its pungency from female perversity. Nobody could possibly guess from the words of Jesus that there was anything funny about a woman's nature. Is the Bible sexist? I think resoundingly, no.